Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, today you and I have front row seats. I guess it's a Lutheran church, so you have back row seats. Front row seats to a collision between two kingdoms. A collision that has been pending for some time now. Something that Jesus said would be coming. The collision between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil. The kingdom of life, kingdom of death. I've heard it said more than once, yeah, the Bible's just so boring. The only way I can conclude that the Bible's boring is by just not reading it, quite frankly. I mean, you want to talk about intrigue, you want to talk about conspiracy, you want to talk about action, good guys, bad guys, plotting, irony, victory. It's all there, especially in today's reading. It's the Tuesday before Jesus will be crucified on Good Friday. And you could cut the tension with a knife. We've been reading all the way through Matthew the past several chapters how the Pharisees have been challenging the authority of Jesus ever since he rode in on that donkey on Palm Sunday, making clear to everyone who, in fact, he knew he was, or at least in his enemies' minds who he claimed to be. And they got a huge response. The crowds came out from all over Judea and beyond. He definitely made a statement. And he was threatening the power, the prestige, the position and the influence of a number of people. A power struggle that was going on even before Jesus got there. And we see two of those powers show up in our text today. The first is you have the Pharisees. We've heard a lot about them, the scribes, the Sanhedrin, the, the establishment of Israel in Jerusalem. The religious rulers who, who ruled over the consciences of the people hanging big bags of burden with the law, as Jesus would say, keeping them under the thumb of what they insisted they had to do to be the children of God. That was their influence. And when Jesus showed up claiming to be the Messiah, and so many people believed him and followed him, they were watching their hopes of remaining in power drift away. And in an act of desperation, they went and found some unlikely friends. We also read in the text today about the Herodians. Now, you have to understand that these two different sets of people, these two different parties, if you will, were diametrically opposed to one another. Both of them didn't really like Rome. Both of them wanted to see Rome go away because they wanted more power. But they took two very different approaches. The Pharisees wanted Rome to go away by the Messiah coming in and conquering Rome. That was their hope. The Herodians were the sympathizers of the day, those that played politics because great King Herod, whose descendant now ruled, Herod Antipas, was half Jewish. And they thought, if we're going to get Rome back to ourselves, then we're going to have to play the game. And so they wanted to support the Herod dynasty. The Herodians and the Pharisees never really got along. They had two totally different approaches to things. But it's interesting, as they say, that politics makes strange bedfellows. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And now this Jesus guy comes in with a massive following trying to disrupt the apple cart. So both parties partner together, and they show up in the text. The Pharisees send their disciples, the Herodians show up, and they ask Jesus this question to try and discredit him in the eyes of the people, to catch him in his words, to entangle him, it said in our text for today. Verse 15 through 16, it says, the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words, and they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, teacher... We know that you're true and teach the way of God truthfully and you don't care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now you have to understand that 
This is the question they come up with in all of their plotting because if Jesus were to answer, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, well, then the Herodians would run off and tell Herod and play politics and Jesus would be labeled as an insurrectionist and dealt with accordingly. But if he said, yes, do pay taxes to Caesar, then of course all of his followers who, who wanted the Messiah to come in and do away with Rome, he'd lose credit and authority in their eyes because now he's paying homage to the very person we're trying to get rid of. They thought they had Jesus in their paws. Of course, they still haven't believed and they still have no idea who it is they're talking to. And as Jesus always does, he'll answer a question with a question. To tell you what he already knows about you, to tell you what the real question should be. So he tells them in verse 18 through 22, aware of their malice, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And here's the answer to the question you did not ask. Render to God what is God's. And they marveled. How do you get out of that one? And they walked away. I said this a couple weeks ago. There's a big difference between knowing the truth and believing it. Big difference between knowing God is real, knowing that Jesus is the Lord, that he's sovereign over all of life, and living all of life in that faith and in that belief. It's ironic, I think, on a number of levels that they tell Jesus, oh, we know you don't care about appearances or opinions, but we're going to put on this appearance for you, put on a show. It's also ironic that the very words they were trying to flatter him with because they really didn't believe it were, in fact, true words. Jesus looks past appearance, straight into the heart. I think it's also ironic that in their attempt to entangle Jesus, they end up tripping over their own shoelaces. And isn't that always how it is? As soon as we try and approach Jesus with anything about our desires, how we want it to go, how we think it should be, anytime we bring our kingdom up to collide with his, it's not his kingdom that falls. It's not his words that get all tripped up. It's ours. Out of all people, the Pharisees should have known. I mean, they knew the scriptures better than anybody. Example after example about what happens when you try and ensnare or entrap someone. You got three great examples just from the well-known Proverbs. If Proverbs chapter 13 verse 14 says, the teaching of the wise is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. Proverbs 22, 5, thorns and snares are in the way of the crooked. Whoever guards his soul will keep far away from entanglement and snares. Or Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. You got to wonder why these guys, I mean, you got to give them an A for effort at least, right? <laughs> they haven't passed a single test, but they keep taking it. How many times before this, the, the, over the, the baptism of John, Jesus saying, I'm not going to tell you by whose authority until you tell me if John's baptism, if that was from heaven. And they said, well, that's not going to end well. If we say this, uh, nobody's going to like us because they feared the people. Time and time again, Jesus tells the parable of the wicked tenants, the, 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 the two sons, and the disciples could see clearly. He knew. They knew. He was talking about them. And what does it say? They, they feared the people. They wanted to arrest him. They wanted to kill him. But 
The fear of man, as Proverbs said, lays snares. That's exactly why they came to try and entrap Jesus. That's why they got entangled in their own trap. Because their priority was their own power, their own possessions, their own pleasure. That entangles all of us. And you don't have to be chasing uh, some political office to be chasing after power. You can entangle yourself in that pursuit in your own home, in your own job, in your own mind, trying to make God do it how you want to do it. Instead of recognizing who's in charge and who loves you and knows what's best for you. You don't have to be chasing millions of dollars to be entangling yourself in possessions either. Or pleasure. So Jesus calls him out. <laughs> Sometimes Jesus just has great style, doesn't he? Give me the coin. <laughs> Who do you see on this? Well, they say the truth. It's Caesar. Well, say, okay, give it to Caesar. But also, give to God's what is God's. Whose image is on this coin, Jesus said. How many problems going on in the world right now could be solved if we answered that question? It doesn't matter what color your skin is. Whose image is on you? How about abortion? Whose image is on that child? Sexual orientation. Whose image? Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. Shouldn't be surprising that that's the very thing the devil then took issue with, right? He knew. God doesn't want you to eat the tree because he knows that you'll be like him. Be made in your own image. You decide up your own mind. It's your decision to make. Anytime we get the image confused, that's when we start to get entangled. Jesus called them hypocrites, and they were. They were the ones entrusted with the things of God. They're the ones that, that taught the truth that there is one God, as we read about in Isaiah. There is no other. His word upholds the universe. And if his word upholds the universe, then what else does it uphold? Everything. Whose image is on the coin? Give to God's what is God's. And what is God's? Everything. Everything. Even the government, even Caesar, even you. That's the good news. That's the good news that God is in control even when we don't see it, that he can't be tricked, he can't be fooled. There's nothing happening outside that can't be solved by giving to God what's already his. These uh, false prophets, Jesus called hypocrites, were false because they tried to keep up appearances, their own image, the image that, that they undoubtedly had in the eyes of the people, that they were the holy ones, that they had it all figured out. I love what theologian R.C.H. Lenski says about prophets. True prophets often manifest sins and faults in their lives. False prophets often have the appearance of holiness as a part of their sheep's clothing. I talk about it in the article that should be in today's Herald newspaper. It's just stunning to me just how every four years we hear these amazing promises. If you just do it this way, if you just listen to me, 
And then every four years, we have to learn this lesson over and over and over again, don't we? Very different than what Jesus does. He was sinless, and yet he took on our sin. Jesus never promised us that it was going to be easy, especially in a world that hated him. But he promised to be with us. He promised us that it's right here at the baptismal font that he put his image on you through his word, that you are his, that here you died so that you would have his life, so that you wouldn't have to worry about what goes on out there. Yeah, do your part. Let your voice be heard. But give to God what is God's. You are his. Jesus ultimately didn't answer their question, really. I mean, the real issue here wasn't about taxes. The real issue here wasn't politics. The real issue here was them challenging Jesus' authority and in doing so challenging the sovereignty of God. And whether we intend to or not, when we, whenever we live in fear because our hope is placed in a man or in a policy or in a vote, we entangle ourselves because our hope's in the wrong place. We stand there like the Pharisees talking to the living Son of God in the flesh and are blind to see who he is because we're concerned about so many other things. Give to God what is God's. What is his? Everything. Even the government. Even the guy you don't like. Only the image of Jesus Christ will last. Only those things at the end when God looks out and sees the image of his son will be the things that endure. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 says, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And he, the Son, is the, exact, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. His image, right here, on you. What does it mean to live a life untangled? Well, Paul talks about that a little bit in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? And let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when you were called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called. There let him remain with God. Living life untangled means to focus not necessarily on anything else except whose you are, who you belong to, the one who can even take that mess and turn it into eternal life. He is the only hope we will ever have. How do you untangle life? How do you untangle marriage? How do you untangle money? How do you untangle politics or problems or anything else in the world? Give to God's what's God's. The untangled life, if you were to put it in a picture, 
may look something like this. Whose are you? Whose image is on you? Galatians 2.20, Paul would say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray. Lord, it's the thing we most quickly forget. As Isaiah said, you alone are God. There is none beside you. And you have made us your children through your own blood, through your work, through your power. Lord, we can look to the cross and have great hope, confidence, and not live in fear because we see what you can do with even the worst this world has to offer. You can turn it into life. And that's what you've done for us in your son. And that scripture says, if he who would not even spare his own son for our sake, how will he not also graciously give us all things? As your children, Help us to trust you with that childlike faith, Lord. Help us to surrender all that we are and all that we have to you because we are yours. In Jesus' name, amen.